All right, Brian. Tell us a bit about your childhood, where you grew up. Um, I was born in Hitchin, and but we were there till I was six, and then I came to Bury, just at the foot of the Downs, and and then just been round here ever since. Moved round in a circle to <laughs> Little Hampton now. Your uh, brothers, sisters? Two brothers, one older, one younger, Steve and Chris. Yeah. And a good childhood? Yeah, brilliant. Playing up in the Downs. Um, not so great back in the hitching because I didn't like the school I went to. It was. <laughs> Horrible. Okay. Uh, so when did you first get into music? I can't remember when I wasn't into music. My auntie Veronica um, sadly died in 1969 when I was three. And um, But she loved um, British, mostly music, Beatles, you know, the Rolling Stones, the Trogs. So all of those records sort of got passed on to me and I remember playing them and uh, knowing what was going on before I could read the labels on the, the records. <laughs> and then um, Dad and Mum, they, they got me a ukulele when I was four. So I used to play along. Um you know, pretending to be George Harrison or something. <laughs> so when did you get your first guitar? Well, eventually, when I was 11, Mum and Dad got me a, a Spanish guitar. Typical awful thing for, for a young hand to get round. Um, but that's the way they always do things. Um, but it helps you a lot because once you've tried to master one of those, you, everything else seems easy. Yeah, so, um, and then the first electric guitar was when I was 13. And it was a. <laughs> used to pick up the radio easy. Um, but I also had got hold of a Marshall, little Marshall 20 watt red. What year was that? Um, 1979. And so, um, when did you get your first band together? Well, used to muck around a lot with my friends around the Petworth, in the Petworth days, um, especially my mate John. And we used to just do anything we could with whatever we could hit, bash or strum um, and then started to play that year 1979 or 1980 I'm not sure between the two started to go over to Eiffold and play with, play with a bloke called Simon Perks and uh, Pierce Collins we didn't have a bass player or a singer just two guitars and drums but eventually we did, and then... Um, Where do you used to play? Um, well, the first gig for that band was Plasto Village Hall <laughs> in the Sticks. Um, the back of the back of Beyond. Um, but then, you know, we did uh, a school swap band thing with that. Um, I went over to the Weald School one day, and they came over to Midhurst. Uh, another time and um, then I can't remember how but I got involved with a band called Zoo Doll with Chris Huckster and Mike Bloomfield Uh, 
Was that back in the 80s? That was 1983 mm -hmm. that started. Um, and it was really good fun. We, we, it was quite sort of experimental. And very noisy. <laughs> <laughs> and we were doing all sorts, going up to London and playing and that. It was when you could do that. And you played at Bogner Hop Hotham Park, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, we played at Bogner. Um, yes, Zootopia. Yes. There's and the walls inside, yeah. Walls inside all covered with um, Jungle Book. Yeah. And um, we used to do coach trips with Zoo Doll. Everyone sort of chip in and uh, get a woods coach. Went up to like the... That was the Clarendon um, in London. But we used to do old the ones in the old Vic in Bond Street. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened after Zudo? Well, I got involved. <laughs> I don't even know if I want to talk about that. It's about <laughs> the Bollock Brothers. <laughs> um that is, but it's unfortunate because that's when I played abroad for the first time. Yeah. It was also the same year that Richard was born. Your son Richard. Yeah. And um, but it didn't work out, unfortunately. And um, so I came back. I didn't have a band because I finished with Zoo Doll. And. Um, so, writing letters and doing it the old school way that we had to do, leaving little cards in like Mike's Music, which is what I did in um, Chichester. Oh, what was his name? John. Can't remember now. Rest in peace. But um, a friend, Mike Shanks, he picked up on this advert that I put to try and get in a band. He lived in Littlehampton, so um, we arranged to meet in the Angel in Midhurst, and he came over and um, said they wanted a guitarist, so I went over to Littlehampton, uh, Wick Farm Road, jammed in there, because always, you know, when you're in bands, local bands, you're just in village halls and stuff all over the place and uh, so we had a band called eventually called the 3220 and uh, that was a good band <laughs> Until about 1991 or something. Um, then I had a band called, band called Hard Times and that was um, doing own material. Right, good evening ladies and gentlemen. We are Hard Time. <laughs> actually and Zoo Doll, that was all our own material. We didn't do mm. much in the way of covers at all. Bands didn't do so much then, I don't think. It was much more inclined to do your own stuff. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what came next? Well, around about the time, it was in hard times. It was about talking about 1991. I'd heard about the Blues Club um, in Little Hampton, run by Frankie Dan. And at the time, he was 
running it from the upstairs at the White Hart. And uh, so I went along with my mate Graham, who was very kindly used to drive me in those days. Um, because he didn't drink. And um, so I took all my stuff there and ended up jamming with Frank and Matt Bazance. I mean, a while of a time with it. <laughs> but eventually, in 1993, and I met uh, John Brooks, and um, he decided that eventually <laughs> that he wanted to get a bl another blues band together because he was with Smack, which is the three piece blues band. And uh, that was just, that was such my cup of tea, Graham Neal. I wanted to be like that. Mm hmm. <laughs> rest in peace again and uh, so we got the JB's Blues Band together <laughs> because uh, I'd been in all these bands doing their own material and it was quite sort of strict in a way. Whereas with the blues, totally not, not strict at all, just jamming really, live. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to hit the right time because we just did loads of it. We were just gigs all the time. Especially once we got hold of uh, Dave Crow. So, no, so what year was this now? Um, must have been right at the end of 93. Right. Um, and Dave came along to jam with us. And then I think our first gig with Dave was at the one of the pubs in Worthing, down by the seafront on the corner. Oh, yeah, um, in on the prom. I think so. Um, and that was great. <laughs> Just such a brilliant front man that we couldn't do anything wrong after that because people wanted to hear blues at the time. And uh, so we just, 94 was such a busy year for us. We were playing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 95, we started doing some bigger events. Um, we did the Chidester Real Island Jazz Festival that year. Um, and the big event at the Bat and Ball. And uh, we went over to Germany to play on the Rhine. That's because we used to do these riotous gigs in the George and Ch Chidester. And um, one night there was a rugby club in. <laughs> and they were so rowdy, Dave didn't want to be outdone by the uh, ruggers. And uh, but the upshot of it all was that we went out to play. The, the gig wasn't very good as it happened. That's the way things work out, as every band knows. So by the time 1997, the JBs had had its day, and uh, everyone was sick and tired of it. <laughs> I think, really. And um, so. Started off doing a band with, called Crosscut. Um, it was that. That was Fox was on the vocals, and uh, Dave Bland on the bass. Um, Neil Mellers on the drums, and me on the guitar. And uh, what did we do? We had a mixture. I did have quite a few of my own numbers in there, but uh, we had quite a good amount of covers as well. Um, we did all right with that um, up until 1999 when I'd met up with Trog again and uh, we started doing a, 
uh, what do you call it, tribute band. It was based on um, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple. And it was called Blackest Purple. Um, <laughs> and we did that for a while. But I didn't really enjoy it. It was way too constricting. And I'm not really <laughs> not really good enough to do uh, Deep Purple. So um, I spoke to Dave and the Trog and we decided we wanted to get another thing together. So we did. Um, we got hold of, um, he had a mate anyway called Nick Metcalf, brilliant drummer. And um, who knew Damien Walsh. And uh, we got together and was uh, trogging the mad dogs. Unfortunately, he wanted to go to Australia, emigrate, which he did do. So we needed another drama. We didn't, it was it's always a dreadful time when you need another drama. But we got hold of Jeff Turner. <laughs> right. She's brilliant. Anyway, we just gigged. Loads of gigs, but they were all complete riots. Just, I think the pinnacle of that was, of the riotousness, <laughs> was we did uh, St. Patrick's Day, which was a Thursday, um, at the Fountain in Chichester, which was one of our haunts, you know. And uh, it was just absolutely mental. Absolutely. Has he got the famous um, Brian on Dave's shoulders? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we had just drinks lined up all across the fireplace and on the floor and everything. Uh, what happened after the Drog and the Mad Dogs? Right, after that, I got going a band called Fat Chav. Which was me, yeah. Jeff, and Adam Pitt on the bass. <laughs> very high energy and um, definitely started a thing going with people doing punk rock again x-ray specs part of the set and uh, brilliant stuff what happened after that after that I wanted to I was ready to go back and do more blues again um, but as a three-piece so we started a band called um, Rough and Ready, that was with yes. Ian Kohlberg and um, Bob Bailey, 
by that time, yeah, that was that's right. Um, I'd packed up drinking, two thousand and eleven, and that was around the time of doing that. And so things became quite different for me for a while. Um, I couldn't rely on anything like that anymore. I just had to try to concentrate on what I was doing but I realised quickly that um, music was going to stick around for me you know it's the thing that made me feel the best so uh, but after a while just got fed up with doing all the blues again so uh, started off with Crosscut again for a while just as a three piece um, and again that sort of that fizzled out after a while. Um, I, I lost, because of the way things were going, especially in the pubs, people weren't enjoying themselves like they used to. And uh, the gigs were all drying up. Lots of pubs were closing. And uh, like they're still going on. Less and less venues to do. And also they were more and more reluctant to keep paying you the same as well even though your pay is already rubbish and so um, that turned into a new area of my life because uh, Sally my darling she won this machine um, on one of her doing a competition and to it stuck around in the house for some years. Um, the software is PreSonus Studio One, and the the bit of kit that you get with it is an audio box that gives you your interface to be able to record and stuff. And um, I was always keen on recording when I was a kid, and I'd had all the old tape recorders, you know, where you press record and play. And you do that, and then you can um, you put that under a cushion, play it, and then you play with it, and you sort of get yourself a multi-tracking thing going on, which <laughs> you just end up with a muddy mess after three or four you know, bounces. Um, but I, later, I had a Fostex, uh, which was still a cassette machine thing, but it did it within itself. But still, it was very unsatisfactory. You, know, you never got much of a result out of it. And um, but this, this new bit of kit, PreSonus and the audio box, was absolutely fantastic. I can't believe what you could do with it. It took me a long while to um, understand how to use it. But um, I decided to really go for it and do tutorials and stuff you know on YouTube and uh, using that I thought I could make use it to make backing tracks right so I would try and keep my live thing going like that well that didn't work out um, because there's no soul in it well not for me anyway and uh, so I, I just completely put it aside but I carried on with Studio One making my own music and uh, the first thing that I put there was in 2016 called I Know Now. It was th So that was the first go at YouTube. Well, it didn't have Sally doing videos. And so I just put a photograph on. I think Sally had to deal with that as well, <laughs> actually. But <laughs> so I just got the, the, the tune running. Well... You know, of course, as you go along, you learn more and more what you're doing and you improve things. Uh, I always decided to leave everything on there because it's kind of, it's like a, I don't know what a good word is, but like a journal of how I've come to where I am now um, with it and you know, obviously, sometimes you look back and some things are a bit embarrassing and, and that, but I don't care. Um, I think it's good to look back and be real about what's happened in the past.
not just with all this, but with everything. I was on holiday with Sal and um, in uh, Minva, <laughs> Cornwall, beautiful. Um, <laughs> but um, I all of a sudden I hatched this idea that I could take live gigs. Oh, I forgot all about. I used to play a lot with Mick Coomis. I forgot about that. Although that was great, it was great that stuff doing that. But um, I took in particular one gig we did at the White Hart in the garden in the afternoon. And I was going through it and uh, listening to all the bits of the crowd making the noises and the kit being set up and, you know, bass being checked or guitar, or whatever. Mick doing his weird chords that he does when he's sound checking and I thought I could take all that and you know cut it from the there and take it and kind of make a song out of just those bits that's why it's called the scrap mm -hmm. and just join them up and see where I could go and that is definitely a journey as well from the start of that to the end and they are in order and one day we'll get them all on there but um, again the start one is before I knew how to do things like drum loops for instance so I was just using literal cuts of Frankie's bass drum and then a snare drum here was some hi-hats etc of course all the samples are what I call dirty samples they've got bits of crowd noise on them so it actually makes this quite an interesting sound that you get with the re repetition of say like someone some kid squealing or you know some punter knocking over his glass or something and uh, I was, couldn't believe it what was coming out you know when I was banging all this stuff in there so enjoyable to do it um, and it kind of, there's, there's like you making it, and you've got the machine, and there's a ghost somewhere that keeps dipping in and making things happen. And, uh, so that was the scrap. And um, you've also been doing some uh, game music. Yeah, I've recently. done a load of game music. I just really do anything that takes my fancy, and it's, it's quite often just something at the time. And we had a whole period of over a year, I think, or maybe quite a bit more than that, but um, of working with Sal, doing a load of songs there, starting with Rise, which I've always been really pleased with that. And uh, game music, yeah, I don't know why. Just fancy doing it. And because um, I used to get into the music playing the old Sega. <laughs> but when it came to Zelda, I just really wanted to do that because I knew that Sally loved it and uh, Toby and Troy and, and the kids, you know, the grandchildren. So that was uh, more sort of for their enjoyment. But again, I, I learned so much while I was picking it apart. Talking about the live side of things for me um, with the backing tracks I've mostly played at the Empress and did a couple of other things but also uh, place over the river um, on the West Beach side of Little Hampton and it got to one day <coughs> and there was this couple of families having their dinner in there and anyway eventually they left and um that was it. There was no one there at all. <laughs> and I can tell you that that really is crushing. So I'd almost decided that's it. I was packing it in for good everything. And I was sort of just getting resigned to it. When uh, Frankie, who I mentioned earlier with the Blues Club, it's a bloke I've played with for years, gave me a call and said that they needed a guitarist for gig on Sunday at the fount I oh know the dolphin 
so it was with um, the Buzzniks and um, when I turned up because Ed couldn't play that day, he was keyboards he couldn't play and there was uh, another chap who couldn't play the bass so Alan was there um, I managed to learn the set on the Saturday and we had quite a good gig and so we, we carried on um, with the Buzzniks <laughs> I think it was um, and that was a great experience and um, but the album didn't do very well uh, although it's it's all right as an album there's nothing wrong with it but uh, it's just the way it is but um, eventually John Bentley who was the leader of that band he decided that he didn't want to carry on with it and um, pandemic happened and uh, so nothing really happened for a while. And uh, then me, Alan and Frank just decided to get together round house just for a laugh and muck about with the guitars and stuff. And we did that for a while. Um, but then... Frank got some gigs given to him um, at the Empress and so we decided to have a proper go at um, making a proper band out of the three of us not just using all the stuff from the past and just a load of blues and stuff no but we made an effort to uh, do something it's all covers um, apart from a couple, um, but they're more sort of, I don't know, not not the, not the sort of perhaps most well-known covers, but they're definitely um, for people people of a certain age group, older, I'm saying, <laughs> can get in touch with the kind of stuff we're playing. Also, it's quiet. I've had to learn how to play and sing quietly. Um, trying to get a good sound out of a band when it's it's very quiet is not easy, not easy at all. You um, started out on your YouTube. The first track uploaded was I Know Now. Um, well, we were always a bit fed up with the fact that um, I Know Now had just that photograph on it. What didn't all the rest have got Sally's videos? She makes all these videos. And um, her journey's like mine. Starts off and then, you know, improve. you improve on yourself all the time. You hope. Yeah. You try to. And um, so it just seemed like a good time to redo I Know Now with my extra knowledge and also sales. Oh, is there anything else you want to add before we go? Also, people, if you can like and subscribe. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I didn't realise how <laughs> Press important Press the like button, was, subscribe but button. you're supposed to like stuff. And subscribe <laughs> to the YouTube channel. I spend half my time avoiding that, but I think perhaps I ought to do it. Yeah, I mean, if you... for karma. If you subscribe, then you'll have the latest that Brian puts out when he, when he does it. You'll yeah. be notified. I hope you'll continue listening because it's fabulous that you do. Um... All the equipment I use is the same stuff I've had since I was a kid. Okay. <laughs> I've got an SG, a Gibson SG, which is my favourite. Telecaster Marshall 50 watt. JCM 800, that is brilliant. And an old sort of BBC like stand. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. All right, then. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. See ya.